Hi, I'm Steve Young for the Co-Round Table in our new office in uh, Landmark Center, an old 1890, uh, I think, courthouse building in downtown St. Paul. And I was reading in The Economist uh, this past week uh, two interrelated articles about the big, um, we call them high tech, but I don't quite know how to describe them. I mean, I'm talking about Facebook, Twitter, uh, Google, uh, Amazon. Um, the first thing that caught my eye actually was a graph uh, in The Economist, which is the operating profit margins of these companies, including um, the Chinese companies of Tencent and Alibaba. But roughly speaking, uh, Facebook, Apple, Alphabet, Google, Microsoft uh, have operating profit margins of over 20% each, uh, some as high as 30 some percent, uh, which is um, stunning and perhaps shocking. My sense is that sort of average profit margins for your average company are more from seven to 12 percent. And my unsophisticated education in economics years ago, when it discussed monopolies and cartels, linked having monopoly market power and cartel market power with much higher rates of profit because, because you could control supply and you could increase prices and you were what the economists call extracting rents. A very, very important concept I think these days with these new high-tech companies, rents versus sort of ordinary profits. Ordinary profits are subject to the pushes and pulls of competition, of, of consumer demand. The consumers can walk, you have to worry about them. Ordinary profits are related to taking care of your stakeholders. If you're a monopoly or a cartel, it's my way or the highway. That's a rent. Going back to, I, I, I think, David Ricardo and maybe Smith long, long time ago about the landlord. You've got the only piece of land that's really good for apple trees in the county you can charge the apple tree grower kind of more or less what you want. Uh, there is some upward limit, however, but basically you're in command of the situation. Um, so on the one hand, we've got these, these companies which have such control. I don't have the figures in front of me of their concentration, the percentage control of markets, but it's really big. I mean, try to get a company that's going to com compete uh, against Google or against Facebook. Uh, TikTok from China, you may have recently seen, very successful competitor on videos, particularly with the younger generation. It may now be bought by Microsoft. So in the news, it turns out that Facebook is going to create a competitor. Uh, Facebook's got the money to do it. So that's one thing. It's profits so high that they seem to confirm the fact that these companies have monopoly powers. And are we comfortable with that? I am not. And the second thing that was in, that was in The Economist this week was a, a, a study some people did about Twitter using algorithms. They have this huge power over their market. And of course, Twitter is so influential that whatever gets trending on Twitter gets picked up by news programs, TV programs, talk shows in America, uh, editorials. You can drive the agenda of culture and politics by getting something to trend on Twitter. So um, what this study did is it looked into uh, Twitter's ability and capacity and practice of tracking the kinds of tweets that you like and assigning them some sort, putting them in some sort of basket for emotional uh, points of view for uh, political points of view, cultural points of view, and then they send you, more, unsolicited by you, more tweets from that basket or related baskets. Now, what the, the algorithm does, according to this research, is that it sends you views and emotions and opinions which are more extreme and more divisive and more controversial than those you hold which is actually shaping the way you think and the way you feel, the way you do politics, is pushing you in towards extremes. If you're on the left, it pushes you more to the left. 
If you're into sob stories, it pushes you more into sob stories. If you're on the political right, it pushes you more to the right. And at the same time, there's a monopoly that's doing this. They are using a technology, unbeknownst to you, without your permission, which is affecting who you are as a person and how you behave in our culture, society, and politics. And we know in the United States that given issues, but particularly the personality of our current president, Donald Trump, that people are so divided, they don't, even, they don't like to talk to each other, even within families. In other words, the cohesion of family and friends and communities is breaking down because either people get into huge fights, which escalate, and then their relationship is broken, or they don't dare bring up any topic. In fact, this morning, I was, I was at the dentist for a regular uh, teeth cleaning, and the, the, um, um, the hygienist who was there, she made some comment, we were in the middle of the pandemic, she made some comment about her feelings about President Trump, and then I saw her realize in her face that she'd gone too far, maybe. And so she was, in, so rather than share with me whatever she really thinks about Trump, she backed away because she was afraid that he is so controversial that I, that I would argue with her and get into a fight, report her to the dentist or whatever. So in short, rather than learning about a fellow citizen and gaining some thinking, uh, I was frozen out. Uh, my question then is why should monopoly companies have the power to use these algorithms to make Americans more suspicious of each other and our politics more divisive.